Okay, wonderful. Well, good evening, everybody, um, or afternoon, um, or morning, if you're if you're elsewhere in the world and we're not sure about. Um, it's great to have so many of you joining us uh, for this kickoff webinar in the latest Common Futures Conversations Challenge. It's wonderful to see some familiar faces coming back, but also some of our newer members. Um, for those of you who haven't met me yet on Zoom, my name is Ben Horton and I run the Common Futures Conversations project, which is now in its fifth year here at Chatham House. Um, I'm joined on my call, on, on this call by Katie McCann, who emails you all the time um, <laughs> with updates uh, about what's going on in the community. And we're really, really excited about the challenge that you're all going to be thinking about over the next couple of months around multilateralism and international cooperation and what can be done to help states make better decisions together about these challenges that we're facing. Um, so I'm just really here to say hello. Um, I will be listening intently to, to what everybody has to say, of course. Um, Katie will be chairing this webinar and I should just finish uh, my remarks by just welcoming uh, Robin Niblett, Sir Robin Niblett, um, who of course is the former director of Chatham House um, who left us very sadly in the summer last year, but it's wonderful to have you back, uh, Robin. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, and I will pass over to Katie to do the formal introductions and, and uh, housekeeping. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for that, Ben. Uh, yeah, so I'll provide you with the formal introduction um, to Robin, and then we'll jump right into his presentation. We'll follow that by a QA. and a um, And if we've got a bit of extra time at the end, then I'll invite you all to join breakout groups where you can discuss uh, the issues from today's session in a little bit more detail with each other. So as Ben was saying, uh, Sir Robin is a distinguished fellow at Chatham House after spending 15 years as its director and chief executive until 2022. He's also a distinguished fellow of the Asia Society Policy Institute and senior advisor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. He's also the principal of Leadwell Advisory, a risk advisory company. Robin is recognized as a leading expert on the relations between Europe, the US and Asia and their implications for risk management by governments and private institutions. So under his leadership, Chatham House tripled in size um, to a full-time staff of more than 200, uh, working on all aspects of international affairs um, that you've all been able to get a taste of being part of the program. Uh, Robin was appointed Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee 2022 Birthday Honours for services to international relations and British foreign policy and CMG in the 2015 New Year's Honours. So I will hand it over to Sir Robin for his presentation. Well, Katie, thank you very much. Definitely Robin um, from now on, that's for sure. Um, but thank you very much for those words of introduction. Yes, and, and Ben, great to be with you. Um, and actually great to be with the Common Futures Conversations um, group this year, um, starting your latest challenge. Um, I can truthfully say that one of the things I'm most proud of uh, from my tenure as director, my rather long tenure as director, um, was that we were able to build up um, a whole suite of activities involving young change makers. I'm going to use that term change makers from all over the world um, and uh, that we were able to get uh, uh, common futures conversations in particular off the ground um, and uh, I'm especially excited that um, the I think I'm right in saying even today that the main geographic focus of that uh, group is uh, Africa and Europe um, and I'll say something about that right at the end of my remarks I know I meant to say some offer some thoughts for 15 minutes or so, so I'll try not to go over that time. If I do, Katie, please start waving or something, um, uh, or just do some subtle nod to me. If I go a bit over time, I'll try and keep an eye on, on my clock at the, at the right there, because I think um, the Africa-Europe vertical is one of the most interesting aspects of the future of international relations and so on. Um, so uh, let me let me kick off and, and jump in then with my, with my thoughts. And... Um, I'll do my own bit of housekeeping because um, otherwise Katie will have to do it and suggest that anyone who's got their microphones uh, not muted should mute them. Wambui Nijehu, amongst them. But that's all right. Just otherwise, um, yeah, we'll hear all the background noise as we go along, which is fine for me, but maybe not fine for everyone else. Um, so let me jump in a little bit um, with my sort of comments about uh, the structure. And I saw the exam question, if we want to call it, 
of what this presentation is about, which is um, you know current changes facing the international system, and in particular, what are the prospects for for multilateralism and for cooperation um, in that uh, world and in that space. Um, and what I thought I'd do, being a good sort of Chatham House person, is uh, actually follow the exam question rather than um, just go on my own little journey. So let me say a word or two, first of all, about current challenges facing the international system. How do I see it? Um, and I still do a lot of work on that big picture stuff these days. Um, then, you know, let's follow this question. If it is a competitive age, second point, you know, what are ways of cooperating? How might we do it uh, in the world that we're in? Um, and then I'll say a little bit of world, uh, a word about uh, are there particular areas where we could uh, focus on cooperation? And I'll finish up with the big question about what can we do for Africa and Europe? So those four points is what I want to run through today. So if I were to kick off right at the beginning, um, first point, and what are the challenges facing the international system? I'll try and put these out very telegraphically, uh, and we can then go into them in more detail. First point, uh, we are in a geopolitically divided world. This has been coming for a while, but it really has settled in as the reality of the world we're in today, specifically because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, I don't want to obsess about that. I'm not going to obsess about it. But geopolitically, that decision uh, taken by Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin, um, the very nature of the decision, the idea that he would actually try to uh, invade the whole country, take it over, pretty much wipe Ukraine off the map, um, the extreme nature of it, uh, and the fact that it's not going very well, has done a very important thing. It's forced China to take sides. I don't think China, Xi Jinping, wanted to uh, line itself up with Russia within the international system, to use that term. But after Russia invaded Ukraine, it had to make a decision. Did it link up with America, uh, Europe and others and criticize Russia and sanction it? Or did it try to take a different route and try to keep a close relationship with Russia for the long term? And it chose to do the latter to keep a close and important relationship with Russia. And it's perfectly understandable why. Because obviously the Chinese are worried that America is out to try to contain uh, it. It needs Russia as a protector, uh, as a source of raw materials and energy, um, as a multiplier of its voice in international forums. China cannot afford to have a Russia that loses the war in Ukraine. So I could talk more about it, but the point is China and Russia have linked up. And by linking up, aligning, they're not allies, China's trying to be careful about how far it goes on this stuff. But what it's done, this whole war, is it's also reinforced the West, the other side of the uh, uh, geopolitical divide. NATO um, has been reinforced, re-energized. America is committed again to European security. Europeans need America for their security. Um, but at the same time, because China has linked up with Russia, what you've got now is America's Pacific allies, Australia, Japan, South Korea in particular, have all thought, hold on a minute, we now also need to commit ourselves much more actively to a sort of combined Atlantic Pacific set of American allies. If we in the Pacific don't show to the Americans that we care about European security, then maybe America will get too preoccupied with Russia and not be with us in the Pacific to protect us against Russia, uh, against China. And the Europeans saying to themselves, gosh, if we don't get more involved in Pacific security, show that we care about the rise of China, then America might abandon us in Europe and spend all of its time looking at China. So you've got this fascinating thing that's happened in the last year, which is almost a sort of uh, uh, the northern hemisphere of the world has split into two competing blocks, a sort of Atlantic Pacific community, all grouped around American allies, and then a kind of China-Russia grouping 
that is saying we will not be dominated by the old west uh, and its allies uh, we need to have a new approach to the world so that would be complicated enough if we had it but there is a third dynamic to what's going on at the moment which is that in a way this northern hemisphere is actually only about 50 countries and as we know the world is made up of 190 plus countries and all of those other countries in the world are saying, look, if you want to fight your new geopolitical divide uh, between America and its allies, Russia and China and its groupings, go ahead. But we are not going to be passengers. We're not going to be proxies in this new Cold War. Uh, and we refuse to accept the divide that you seem to be creating. And actually, what's interesting is unlike the non-aligned movement of the last Cold War, this grouping actually has real heft. It has clout. It has bigger population. It has larger economies that matter both to Russia and China and to America, to Europe, to Japan. So as you look at the world today, India, Brazil, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Central Asian nations, Nigeria, South Africa, you know, are all saying, oh, we're going to we're going to play both sides. We'll be friends with America on some things. We'll be friends with China on others. We might trade with Russia when we need to. We might be critical of Russia at other moments. So uh, in a way, this is a fascinating moment because those other countries are much more empowered than they were before. So that's the world in which that's the international system as I see it, three communities in a way that are awkwardly trying to work out the new rules of the game between them. Um, now, what does that mean? You know, in this age of competition, which was the question you had on your list here, how do you do cooperation? You know, how do you do it to help citizens' lives? The problem is there's going to be no, or practically no global multilateral cooperation for the next five to 10 years. I just don't see how in a world where the two sides are so suspicious of each other, the Russia-China community, the America and its allies community, they're so suspicious that they can't agree on a global or multilateral system. You've got the Chinese kind of pole, and China is powerful enough, uh, much more powerful than Russia, it's power and powerful enough to create a pole. And what they're trying to do is saying, look, we can't change America's minds. We probably even can't change Europe's minds. We'll try to not let a new big battle happen, a new Cold War happen. But what we need to do is we need, we the Chinese, need to offer a new vision of international order and multilateral cooperation. So what they're doing is launching a whole series of initiatives. One is the Global Development Initiative, which is mostly about infrastructure, uh, and trying to help that big non-aligned world uh, move up the economic development ladder. It was the old Belt and Road Initiative, but that has not been as successful as maybe the Chinese had hoped. Now they talk more about uh, the role that the new development bank will play. They're using the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, uh, uh, China, South Africa grouping um, as, a, as a new umbrella which is more inclusive of that non-aligned community with China and Russia, yeah, to try to reduce the power of America and say, we, not just China, but we, this much larger community, have got a real plan for global development. And we understand it. We're still doing it. Trust us. And at the same time, they're saying, and we believe in peace as well. So the Chinese have done a deal with Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, they uh, put forward a proposal on the Russia-Ukraine. They're talking about Israel-Palestine. So again, the Chinese are trying to show that maybe we can be an agent for security in ways that the Americans uh, couldn't do before. The problem, in my opinion, and now I'm going to not be descriptive, I'll give you my own sense. There's a real problem to the Chinese approach, which is that it's all based on the Chinese model. And the Chinese model puts the power of the state above the rights of individuals. Now, China says, well, of course we do. If you want to be able to drive economic development, you can't have 
hundreds of parties competing with each other for elections and 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 civil society groups that just stop you from doing anything environmentally or you know it's too chaotic all of those groupings civil society groups political parties all need to be subservient to what you know a single party or a strong leader can drive in terms of economic development in a simplification that is the kind of model around which a lot of their development and a lot of their peacemaking takes place. In my opinion, that can work in the short term. It tends not to work in the long term. You've then got this other community, let's call it the Western, you know, uh, Pacific, US, European approach, which have a very different idea. Now, the problem is they, you know, we, it's we, because I'm part of that community, we're coming out of, or we're still in, a really tough economic period where globalization. Uh, which was great for us for 50, 60, 80 years, has now ended up creating real winners and losers in our communities. So we've lost our engagement with the world. We're all about Americans first or Europeans first, worried about our own development, worried about our own economic markets. We're really finding it hard to think about the rest of the world. Um, and so only now, literally in the last six months, I'd say, have uh, Japan... South Korea, America, Europe started to realize that they're in a global competition for influence about how can you drive economic growth around the world? How can you come up with new forms of cooperation that are global for other countries? So with specifics, you've got a global partnership for infrastructure investment that the uh, G7 group of countries are now putting forward to compete with the new development bank. Now we'll see, it, it literally, we'll see whether it works or not. It's early days yet. The EU is trying to still do some trade agreements around the world. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and in the UN, uh, uh, America, Europe have realized that they've kind of lost their, they, they've taken their eye off the ball in the UN. China now chairs four or five key UN committees. Um, and the Chinese approach is sort of changing the norms uh, inside uh, the UN to one in which the rights of individuals uh, are being reduced and uh, the power of states are being increased. And this could have all sorts of implications for how we govern the internet, how you govern artificial intelligence, how you do development spending, et cetera, et cetera. So all I would say is in terms of that cooperation, China has a plan. It's driving an agenda. Europe and America are desperately trying to play catch up right now. And they're not there just yet. So um, what is the potential for real global cooperation at this time when it's really quite competitive between these two uh, communities? Um, the one thing I'd say is that actually the fact that America and its allies are having to compete with China to try to, to, to drive development in their own way in Africa, in parts of Asia, in parts of Latin America, in parts of Central Asia. The fact that it's competitive may actually be good. It means there'll be more money. Uh, uh, countries, uh, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, but in other parts of the world as well, will be able to choose in a way between money coming from uh, uh, America and Europe, money coming from China, money coming from Turkey. There's a real opportunity for you to try to you, I'm um, talking to that, to, to the callers on this call coming from African countries, to perhaps be able to pick and choose between them in the ways that you want. I hope at the same time um, that we will have some, uh, um, how can I call it, that we'll have some uh, opportunities for both sides to work together, the Chinese grouping, let's call it, and the American grouping. But, you know, Pretty much the only part of, of the global agenda where I could see those two communities coming together is around climate change. And that's, okay, it's a big agenda, but it's about the only area where the two sides don't feel there's a sort of zero sum competition between them. There is a bit, but it's not as intense as it is in technology, health, uh, trade, infrastructure, in all of those big global areas these two poles, the two of the Northern Hemisphere poles I described at the beginning are competing with each other too much. So, um, you know, when we think about how multilateral organizations can adapt, as you can tell, I'm not very confident that we're gonna see much at the UN level or in the WTO or in the World Bank 
or even the G20. The best we can have hope for, I think, on multilateralism is maybe regional forms of multilateralism, whether it's more in the EU, more in Southeast Asia, uh, more in Africa, which now finally has its own continental free trade agreement. Those would be maybe some of the opportunities that I can see at the multilateral level. And that brings me to my closing point, um, where I'm roughly on 15 minutes. Um, my closing point is about how do Europe and Africa work together. Um, it is inevitable. It's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the Common Futures Conversations. It is inevitable that uh, geographic vertical parts of the world, hemispheric verticals, are going to have to work more closely together. North America has spent too long ignoring South America. And now South America is coming to North America, literally because of changes in climate, changes in, in governance and so on that are taking place there. And America is finally, well, hopefully, starting to look south. Um, China has been looking at its vertical for a long time. And there's a real integration taking place economically between its communities to the south of China. Some is being resisted, some is being followed. But there's this, it's taken Europe decades to wake up to a sort of trying to think through a post-colonial agenda, if I can call it, uh, to have with Africa. But it's one uh, which has to be much more a partnership of equals. Uh, and where that has to come from is in our mutual dependency. Um, in Europe, we need more young people. Um, either those young people need to come and work in our societies and be able to do so through clear routes for, for migration, um, uh, or otherwise, we need to be able to providing opportunities for each other on both sides uh, of the Mediterranean, if you want to call it, uh, as the kind of geographic dividing line. Um, and that could be around agriculture. It could be around renewable energy. It could be around new critical minerals. Um, uh, it could be around new business opportunities. There is so much that we could do together, but only if we create structures for that. And I'm hopeful, this is my last comment, that um, uh, the EU, which is you know, one of the most developed uh, trading organizations in the world, could start to find ways to build up conversations, not with individual African countries, but also increasingly uh, with the uh, free trade agreement that the continentally has been agreed in Africa, and start to create some dialogues uh, that really are much more equal and much more north-south. So, you know, my closing, closing point, uh, Katie, would be to say, I'm not optimistic about multilateralism in a world where China and Russia are competing deeply and viscerally with America and its allies. But if we focus more in our geographic lanes, in our verticals, maybe we can overcome that divide and do some things in our own area that will make a difference to our citizens. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for giving such a comprehensive and kind of far reaching view of the situation in such a short amount of time. I'll dive right into the Q&A because we've got so many questions coming through in the chat. Uh, if you would like to ask your question, um, you can just raise your hand. I just remind you that if you've got bad connection, it's probably just easier to type it. Um, or if you're in a noisy area, then perhaps turn your video off um, if you would like to speak. Um, I'll start with Crystal King, who's asked a question about um, the state of, the, of sovereign equality in the United Nations. Um, do you think that that's improving or do you think that the current state of affairs is leading to a decline? You know, uh, in the UN, we have to, there's something I was going to talk about. You've got to break it out. In the UN Security Council, sovereign equality is not obviously improving. And I'm afraid I have very little optimism that it will improve um, because it's too difficult. <laughs> you know, theoretically, India, at the very least, should be a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Um, you know, you could pick a bunch of other countries that should be in there as well, depending whether you measure on population, measure on... Uh, uh, GDP, take your pick. But the fact is the UN Security Council is a hangover of the Second World War that is imposs impossible to disentangle. And it has this overlay of recognized nuclear powers in it as well. Um, and so what I would simply say to you in the interest of time, 
is this not worth the effort <laughs> to try to fix the UN Security Council? There are things you can do on the margins. It may be possible to have certain situations in which the veto is overruled that are not to do with the pure security of an individual member. Uh, there are, the French in particular, have come up with a bunch of uh, proposals in this space, which are quite interesting. So, um, you know, you could work on the margins on that front. But I think the principle of sovereign equality uh, in the UN Security Council uh, is, is limited. Now, where you do have sovereign equality, um, at least in terms of kind of voting weight, if you want to call it that, is in the UN General Assembly. The problem is the UN General Assembly doesn't have power. <laughs> yeah, it can it can take a vote, but it, it you know that vote is non-binding, and ultimately uh, everyone just follows through and does what they feel they need to do. As we've seen, even on Ukraine most recently, with with several UN General Assembly votes uh, telling Russia to to withdraw, um, with with large majorities uh, in favour of them. Uh, I think. What I try to think about with that kind of multilateral cooperation is whether has the UN system developed something interesting or not with uh, the UNFCCC, the climate change process. Here, the conclusion was you can't take away um, sovereign power. I won't talk about sovereign equality, but where each government refuses to be overruled by another government. And the way they've tried to fix that in the context of the Paris agreements on climate change is to say, look, we will not have a legally binding agreement to achieve net zero by 2030, is it by 2050? Uh, it'll be legally binding only in the sense that each national government commits to make a series of steps to achieve those goals. They are called then nationally determined contributions. You can listen to those words, nationally determined contributions. Each nation commits something. And then what the multilateral system does is it polices the commitments that individual countries have made. And so what you try to do is you try to shame or, or, or shine a light through the UN system, through the multilateral system on what individual governments have said they would or wouldn't do. And you try to drive change by, by uh, uh, humiliating or shaming countries that fall behind on their commitments. And I think that actually may be a way of driving change in particular areas, maybe on global health. China is under huge amounts of pressure right now, still today, to talk about where the COVID you know, uh, outbreak uh, came from. And they've tried to defend themselves in many, many ways. But you've seen, even in the last couple of months, the Chinese now starting to, to throw out some ideas. And there was a sort of supposed uh, reveal um, that you know, there may have been some, um, uh, some experimentation that took place in the Wuhan lab. A Chinese member of the Chinese Centers for Disease Control said this. The government hasn't said anything. But you could see uh, China does not want to find itself completely on the outside of where the World Health Organization and the international health regulations are going. So what I would say is sovereign equality um, is a very clunky thing. I did my PhD on an aspect of European integration, the EU. The EU has spent, uh, I've got to get a year here, 70 years nearly, grappling with the ideas of how to manage sovereign equality, but still try to cooperate. And so the EU has actually, its member states have given up sovereignty in certain areas. They do not determine their trade policy. They do not determine uh, aspects of their regulatory policy. And it's incredibly difficult. And the UK left <laughs> because of that, yeah? And other countries are now trying to resist it. So I'd say don't get too hung up on sovereign equality or even sovereignty. Think of ways to cooperate <clears throat> where you work around sovereignty. You accept sovereignty. You accept inequality of power. It's real. It'll never go away. Be clever. Think of ways around it. How can countries group together to outweigh others? How can you use new institutions? How can you use uh, shaming, naming and shaming? You've got to be really creative in what you come up with with your ideas. Don't, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, don't tilt at windmills. 
Don't try to win battles that are unwinnable, okay? Try to be clever. <laughs> it would be what I would say to you and whatever you do over the next year. Right, sorry, went on a long track there. I'll be quicker with the next questions, Katie. Um, so we've still got loads of questions coming in I'll the chat, quick. so I'll dive right into the next one. Uh, from Maheen Russell, uh, do you think the third world or much of the non-aligned world is not too enthusiastic to pick sides or is it ambivalent because geopolitical competition hasn't served its interests in the past? Do you think that to bring these countries on board, the West needs to develop a plan of inclusive growth and to help these countries catch up on the socioeconomic ladder? Uh, look, totally. So I could even be very quickly and say yes. Yeah, I mean, the hypocrisy of Western countries uh, knows few bounds. Um, I'll say that as a kind of signed up member you know obviously to to uh, british and i've worked in america and so I'm part of that community uh, and i believe that liberal democracy i'll use that term systems of government where there's a competition between branches of government where civil society has a strong voice where there is transparency where there is rule of law you know that's the best system of government if you can get there yeah but the reality is we've used it for ourselves but we were very happy to partner with countries around the world for whom those values had nothing to do with what they did. Definitely in the Cold War, but even after the Cold War, we carried on doing that. So in the end, uh, it's up to us, us, America, Europe, and so on, to put our money where our mouth is. Um, and in a way, um, try to engage some more uh, economically with, let's call it the non-aligned, the very large number of non-aligned countries. Now, there's two problems, okay? Um, you know, it's, so I could stop there, yeah, and just say it, I agree with you. But <laughs> one problem is right now, as you know, and even all the Europeans on the call will know this, we're going through a really tough time ourselves. Now, it might not, you might not think it's very tough in your certain parts of the world, but when people lose what they had, they tend to fight a lot more for it, you know, because you know what you lose. You don't know what you don't have in some ways. And middle classes in Europe and in America, there have been real losers from globalization and they're fighting tooth and nail to hold on to what they've got. So when President Biden talks about a foreign policy for the middle class, what he means is that American economic policy and trade policy should be geared towards increasing the living standards of Americans first. That's pretty tough, you know, to then at the same time offer something. So when China is pumping out billions of money to uh, support economic growth or infrastructure in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, um, America has practically nothing on offer in return, even the Europeans have been incredibly, we've been cutting our foreign aid in the UK. Um, so we're not offering the alternative at the moment. So, you know, the simple thing is to say, uh, you need to leverage this moment, you or African countries, at least, and those of you who believe in the kind of change I've been talking about, need to leverage this moment to say, look, we're going to have to pull back on conditionality and do more on just putting money on the table um and um, being less hypocritical so yeah i'll stop that I could go on for a long time but i agree with you i'll combine the next two questions well i'll ask them um uh, right next to each other yeah. in the same grouping so we've got nasifo dube who says thank you very much from south africa um and she asked a question about young people and um, in yeah. what ways do you see multinational institutions being able to assist and empower apathetic civil society and young people as she speaks specifically about um situation in Zimbabwe, who are in difficult socio-political uh, contexts. Um, we've also got Mako Muzenda, um, who says, thank you again. Um, how realistic is it to accept that Europe and Africa will come together as equal partners in light of its colonial history? Yeah. Um, sorry, I was just reading that last bit. Give me so give me the end of the second question again, could you, Katie? Yeah. So um how realistic is it to accept that Europe and Africa will come together as equal partners in light of colonial history and continue perception of yeah. Europe looking down on African countries? Yeah. Um, well, then maybe let me start with that 
part first um because they're quite different questions yes so just i'm just making sure here i got i got them uh at the, the end of both sides so i might get you to repeat the first one in a second let me just start with that one about how optimistic am i about our ability to to overcome this um look the the difference right now is that uh if you're going to take a realistic view of where we are on economic and foreign policy um in Europe now, we need Africa and an African input in the way that uh, we might have also done in the colonial era. But the colonial era, we could just come and take it, and we did. <laughs> and in the modern era, we can't. So, yeah, you know, Britain, Belgium, Germany, France, take your pick, you know, wanted to have big empires, wanted to make their populations wealthy basically came and took the raw materials from and people for a long period from Africa because we lived in a brutal era when power made right and or power was might and you could do it and we did it. Um, in today's world, we can't. <laughs> There's too few of us. We're not strong enough. The rules have changed. I would like to say on the, if I had to be positive about it, I'd say that Europeans have evolved um, politically, morally, uh, from where they were a hundred years ago, or maybe even more recently than that. Um, so that's on the positive side. On the other side of it, we still need Africa. In fact, we may need Africa more than we did before. A, because our populations are aging, therefore we can't, we just don't have the engine for growth domestically to be able to put up with our aging societies and be able to make sure that they have a decent standard of living later on. So one or two things are going to happen. We're either going to have to take a huge amount more migration, immigration. The EU estimated, and this was about seven years ago, it estimated that Europe needed net immigration of 2 million people per year just to keep the same ratio of young to old populations that we've come to rely on to run our pension systems. And we're nowhere near that. We've been on a net immigration about 500, 600,000 net. So, you know, Europe needs massive amount of immigration now if we can't take them for political reasons because there's opposition because you know people protest about it or parties try to block it then you're going to have to drive growth in africa so that you could try to use the young people's uh, um, ingenuity drive uh, um, market capacity consumption power in africa as partners for a europe uh, uh, Africa kind of economic partnership. We need it desperately. I would say that I think in Africa, you would benefit from the technological know-how, from some of the foreign investment that uh, European countries can offer. So, you know, theoretically, and look, it's a little pie in the sky. I'm being a little bit optimistic. I'm not naive um, on this. It should be possible to be able to start to drive some of those changes, but it has to happen on both sides. Uh, African leaders need to uh, give an opportunity to their youth, to their civil society, to their businesses to really use that foreign investment. They've got to help create the markets in which that can happen. Um, we in Europe need to open up our agriculture markets. We need to uh, uh, invest in solar power. We need to help invest in you know, lithium mines that are driven on, on effective uh, uh, and transparent forms of government. These are incredibly difficult things to do. I'm not naive. Um, but what I'd say is when you get to a position where there's no option, that tends to drive change. And there's no option in Europe. We literally cannot survive the way we are in Europe in five to 10 years time. Uh, and so if there was ever an opportunity to drive partnership, I'd say it is now. Now, Katie, just give me the first question again, because I felt the first question was not about that at all. Uh, yeah, so she was asking about how multilateral organisations can kind of come in and combat some of the apathy that civil society and particularly young people are feeling. Yeah, how can they get young people involved? Um, you know, the kind of groupings, uh, multilateralism, sorry, we're playing with big words here, yeah, Multilateralism is not going to engineer stronger civil societies within African or other societies in the future. Why? Because I said in my opening remarks, uh, China, Russia, many 
actually countries in the, the new non-aligned movement is hugely suspicious of civil society. All right. Um, China <laughs> rejects any form of civil society. Uh, India, from what I can see, the Modi government is more and more suspicious of civil society. So this is not just about authoritarian governments and democratic governments. In Turkey, civil society organizations have been gutted. So, um, you know, this is an era in which civil society organizations are vulnerable. One of the few parts of the world that really supports civil society and has the money to support them is Europe. One of the parts of the world that I see civil society organizations really trying to break through and, and, and doing amazing things is sub-Saharan Africa. Um, you know, Northern Africa, less successful. Look at Tunisia, look at Morocco, look at Libya, look at Algeria, not so successful. But in sub-Saharan Africa, there are and many of those groups are represented on this call amongst our, our CFC grouping. Um, there's a real opportunity here. So in a way, I don't know Africa well enough to know whether civil society organizations can strike these partnerships with partner organizations in Europe. In a way, that's what the CFC is. You are that in living life, yes? You're trying to make this thing happen. Now, there are plenty of foundations who'll put money in. There are plenty of governments in Europe that will give funding that has to be channeled through civil society organizations that will not be paid to central governments where they think the central governments may end up siphoning that money off to Swiss bank accounts or banks in the Virgin Islands or wherever it is. Um, uh, so what I would say is seize this moment if you are representative of civil society, strike the partnerships with, with groups in, um, in Europe, try to use the chaos of this moment, of this geopolitical moment, yeah? Don't rely on your governments and see if you can, can you know, use democratic environments where you have them. You don't have them in all countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but in those countries where you do, try to use civil society as agents of change. I mean, I, I can't say more than that, really. I'm, I know I'm waving my arms around here a lot because this is all very optimistic stuff. But um, if I were a young person, that's what I'd be doing right now. Thank you so much for answering my question that extensively. <laughs> well, good luck in, in trying to do it. And anything we can do at Chatham House to help, we will. Uh, Thank you. Um, so I think I'll throw it over to Ely, um, who's got his hand raised. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Sir Robin Niblett, for uh, all your contributions. Um, and my question uh, is a, it's a bit of a follow up. <clears throat> on this uh, Europe-Africa cooperation on uh, this vertical scale. Um, as you really emphasized all the points why uh, Europe should cooperate with Africa and why that makes a lot of sense, especially understanding that there is no option for Europe uh, other than that. Um, however, uh, and seeing other questions in the chat that also emphasize that, given the presence of the CFA Frank right now in West Africa and all other contingents, what pushes Africa to cooperate with Europe. Um, I'm currently taking this call from Abidjan himself in, in the Ivory Coast. And the feeling I get from here is simply that we could have better trade partners if we were talking about, you, you mentioned FDIs. We do not need the FDIs from Europe. We could cooperate with other um, poles in the world. Um, and when it comes to technology, why work with Europe when America and China are on the forefront of that? Um, and so on the bigger picture, I completely understand everything about um, the regional uh, multilateral cooperation, but yep. this international uh, inter uh, cooperation seems limited in this scale for African nations, which yep. who, to me, at least in West Africa, have much more of an interest to cooperate either uh, locally or uh, with other actors. And just quickly, which would the which would be other actors that they're particularly you're particularly interested in cooperating with? China obviously would be one, but are there others? Well, China comes up as one, but um, given given the history um, of the non-aligned movement and uh, the current rhetoric from Brazil, for instance, this is something we could have that could be developed. Um, obviously, me currently being in the Ivory Coast, the cooperation with France is still very very present. 
but yeah. there is this certain feeling that it is yeah. a historical one and seeing the uh, movements in Senegal, the youth movements yeah. and seeing the different types of stations, this is, it, it doesn't seem like it is feasible for the future to with, uh, yeah. to perpetuate no, I, I, such I, No, thank you. Thanks for that question. I mean, it's frustrating. Um, look, my, my view on this is, uh, you know, if China's willing to throw in billions of of dollars into development in in Africa, and in the end, China needs a return on them. Yeah, uh, Russia has got a very different approach. I mean, I do not put Russia and China in the same basket. Personally, I think China, in the end, does want African countries to succeed, uh, because if African countries are successful, it will be successful as well. Unfortunately, the Chinese development approach tends to be very top down very centralized, and they're as happy to give money to Mugabe when he was alive, uh, as they would do to, you know, a democratically elected uh, government in Ghana or somewhere. And as we know, Mugabe and Namangawa are after him, just the money just gets wasted appallingly. Um, and I just hope that at some point, China will, will be more discerning, if you see what I'm saying, um, in, in, in where they apply uh, those funds. Russia, on the other hand, is all about zero sum, I'm afraid. It's about extraction. It's about corruption. It's about having proxies who will, you know, support them in the UN. It's about imitating the Russia model of, I'll put it bluntly, kleptocratic government. And if citizens in sub-Saharan African countries want to be led by kleptocratic governments of their own, then cooperate with Russia because that's what you'll get. There's just no other, they don't know any other system. And there is no example anywhere of Russia having helped other countries uh, do better, even on the security side of things, as we know, their approach to security is brutal um, and tends to then just build up new problems for the future. So I, I would just distinguish between, you know, I'm not being Western about it, saying to only take support from the West. Uh, Turkey is a very interesting question, a uh, very interesting country, which has invested, as I understand it, quite a bit, I think, into the Horn of Africa. Um, and Turkish companies and so on are quite interesting on that front. India um, has pockets uh, of investment, which are very interesting as well. So I would I would be encouraging African countries to diversify, you know, take funding from wherever you can. But uh, in my opinion, uh, if it, for just for saying what it's worth, I think Russia is toxic, uh, Russian money. So, um, and they and they will play on the history of that moment, yeah, when they were supporting, uh, um, you know, uh, freedom movements of independence movements and so on. And obviously they were not the colonial power in Africa. Uh, they were colonial power in other parts of the world, but not in Africa. Um, and so they've got, you know, I get it. I get where the politics comes from. But, you know, I would simply say, uh, God help countries that, that partner with uh, with with Russia. Um, now on Europe, let me just say something about technology because that's a very interesting point. You know, um, you can collaborate with Europe economically and technologically. You, in the sense that uh, both China and America are the world leaders on new technologies. Obviously, it was on. Uh, uh, computers it then became on social media platforms and other platforms. Now it's on AI. Uh, they have the big markets, they have the technology development, they have the right domestic infrastructure and the money to do it. But it doesn't mean that countries around the world can't then leverage the technology developments that are being made in China and in uh, uh, America to be able to drive their own development, smart cities, smart grids, uh, online payment systems. Now you could have a debate, yeah, about whether you'd rather have the American system, where the companies take your data and play with it, or the Chinese system, where they will give all of that data to the government, and the government may then be able to use that economic development to then impose political control. I would argue that I would rather, personally, have companies take my data and have governments take my data. You know, neither of them are particularly good. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather we have the European system, but unfortunately the European system tends to be not very good at developing technology. We spend too much time regulating it. But, you know, if I had to pick between 
uh, uh, you know, I'd compete between the two, see which is the better price. But in the end, I'd rather uh, partner up with American technology if it's available and priced properly than with Chinese technology, where in many cases, the Chinese government that backs it will do a deal with the local government. And you'll suddenly find that your smart city, which is so good at providing you know, perfect payment systems and smart water systems is also tracking your every movement and selling that data, not selling that data, giving the data to the government, which may then crush the civil society movement uh, that may be so good for your country. So, you know, again, be realist about it. You know, don't be, don't be romantic. <laughs> um, uh, and I would take the American money any day or the American technology any day over the Chinese technology but I would take some Chinese technology and then try to use it to leverage to get some of the American money. You know, right now you can play both sides because the Americans are desperate not to lose Africa. They don't want to lose Africa to China and Russia. They want to have you on side. Uh, so, you know, play that, play it to the hilt uh, would be what I'd say about that. Right. I could probably say more, but there's, I've, the, the questions keep growing and we've only got seven or eight minutes left. So keep going, Katie. Oh, back to you. Uh, I'll hand over to Haya, um, who's got her hand raised, and I'll ask you to be as brief as you can, if possible. Well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Robin, for this insightful session. So uh, I basically come from North Africa, and uh, uh, the problems we have with Sub-Sahara are quite relevant, especially recently with the anti-feeling uh, of migrants in Tunisia, and uh, also the anti-French feeling. So how do you expect us to um, do the vertical partnership while we, as Africans, we don't come together and we have like widespread uh, yeah. uh, hate feeling against the uh, French, especially? Thank you. Yeah, so, such a good question. Um, and I, I read about it, I see it um, uh, a lot. And as you said, the intra-Africa divisions, and it could be intra-Sub-Saharan and North African. It can be intra-North African. As you know, one of the least integrated parts of the world economically wasn't just Sub-Saharan Africa. It's Northern Africa, Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, Libya. I mean, just it's tragic uh, what goes on there. And a lot of this is a hangover from the colonial era. And now on top of it, obviously, you've got the anti-immigrant uh, feeling taking place in Europe. And by the way, a lot of the anti-immigrant feeling isn't even your fault, your fault in terms of Africa, in terms of the people coming from there. It's that we haven't worked out in the Euro in the EU and in Europe how to share the immigrants effectively, how to actually turn it into an advantage rather than a problem. You know, so we have our own feelings, our own problems inside our own societies, where um, you know, rapid changes in, in migration. Uh, can can lead to huge political problems inside Northern Europe as well. So we're all suffering from the same problems. Uh, you know, what can we do about it? You know, the only way that you can manage this, uh, that we can manage it, is if there's economic opportunity in the end. Uh, you know, you can't, you can overcome feelings of um, historical uh, uh, resentment and historical, um, you know, justified historical uh, uh, frustration and anger with other countries, if there's growth, you know, economic opportunity overcomes everything. So, you know, my view is, we have to kind of try to park those things. You know, can you get uh, there are companies, especially in the energy space, in the energy space, in the mining space, companies are used to working in really insecure and difficult environments. They've done it forever. So, you know, but can we start to get um, companies from uh, Europe, maybe from China as well? I, I've been writing about, I just don't know if it's possible, that European and Chinese companies should work together on energy projects in North and Sub-Saharan Africa that would take solar power across the Mediterranean, you know, into um, into Europe, where we desperately need it. Um, but in a way, you have to almost park the geopolitics, put them to one side to be able to take advantage of those kinds of opportunities. And I, 
I don't know what to say about it because in a way you have to go very granular. You have to go into each country. You have to look at what each country has to offer to economic growth in Europe. You then have to work out which companies are going to invest in it. Then you have to work out which part of the of, of the government or which governments are ready to do it. So rather than just me trying to, to explain something that it, that it has to be too granular, um, what I would say is, is you undertake this project uh, for common futures. Um, try to pick like three sectors where you know Africa and Europe have to work together. Um, definitely renewable energy, whether it's critical minerals and maybe separately, uh, transport of solar power and energy, literally transported from the south to the north. Uh, secondly, it could be uh, processed agriculture, not just selling, you know, great products from sub-Saharan Africa to the north. How could you get the EU to invest in agriculturally, uh, in processing foods uh, in sub-Saharan Africa? Let's say cocoa, making chocolate, not selling cocoa beans, you know, um, how could you then think about technology? How could you use blockchain technology to develop new forms of selling products from sub-Saharan Africa into Europe that don't go through the big, huge companies that in many cases have been bought up and have maybe corrupt arrangements with corrupt governments? I mean, I just think there must be so many areas where if you could identify very practical outcomes that would deliver some returns. Uh, I heard Strive Masiwa, who's you, many of you will know him, very successful former Zimbabwean uh, telco uh, uh, business leader. Um, he gave a talk at Chatham House four or five years ago where he reckoned that the new technology we're developing could actually encourage smallholder farming, not mega farming. Smallholder farming could become economically viable in sub-Saharan Africa in ways that it is not economically viable in Europe. So there must be ways to, to, to take the geopolitical moment where you can play China and America and Europe off against each other, look at the need we have in Europe, the need you have in Africa, then spot three or four sectors where African-European partnership would make a difference, then try to find maybe a private foundation, um, a government uh, a development agency, and maybe a local government that might help in some way. Uh, I'm making it up here. Maybe it's through mayors. Don't go to the main government. Go through cities. And then try to work out your change agent maybe isn't a national government. It's a city or a region. You know, you, you need to be really bottom up. You've got to be bottom up to drive this change. Because the geopolitics, the multilateralism is crap <laughs> for the next. The geopolitics can be really bad for the next five, ten years. I'm sorry, I work mostly on that these days because it's bad. And I'm worried about it getting worse. But the positive change needs to find its way through that minefield. And don't try to change the big system. It's unchangeable right now. It's unchangeable. Don't waste your breath on it. <laughs> That's what I would say. Sorry, carry on. Katie. I know we're at the top of the hour. I've got a few more minutes if you want. I'm, I'm flexible. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you're flexible, then absolutely. I think we would all love to hear, keep hearing some of your thoughts. Um, we've got one question kind of continuing on the topic of migration, what we are talking about. Yep. Um, Dimitri Christofi, um, I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly, um, is asked, how do you interpret current multilateral efforts as they relate to global migration? I'm imagining she's thinking of the recent um, migrant crisis in the news. Do you see potential for greater multilateral cooperation to prioritize uh, the safety and well-being and the lives of migrants um, while supporting nations that welcome migrants? No. <laughs> I just don't. I'm sorry. You know, I, I'd love I could, you know, I'd love to tell you something positive. I just think at a multilateral level, it is just so difficult. I mean, I'm looking at Europe. I'm looking at Britain, for God's sake, you know, um, where, you know, the politics are increasingly toxic and difficult. Um, and where a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, like took place uh, a few days ago off the coast of Greece. You know, that tragedy happened in a way because you know, Italy and France are fighting over where migrants should land and shouldn't land. 
You know, the French keep criticizing the Italians for sending too many immigrants over the over the border into France. Um, you know, Britain is trying to use the, the channel as a, as a protective mechanism. We're not creating sufficiently proactive legal routes. And unless you, unless you have the legal routes, it's like drugs. The demand and the supply will find a way. And I'm not calling people drugs, but you know what I mean. Uh, illicit mechanisms emerge inevitably. And uh, it's big business because people are desperate to move. And the demand is there. If the demand wasn't there in our countries, people wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have jobs. They'd be sleeping on the street. But actually, look at the health system in the UK. We need more people. Um, and we're not bringing them in fast enough. Uh, and so the opportunities keep emerging. Now, I, I, as you can tell, I'm not a totally negative person. I just I can't think of the multilateral organization that's going to take this on and overrule the sovereign interests that are so dominant in America and in Europe in particular, because those are the two regions. You could ask, why the hell doesn't China take more immigrants? And why didn't more immigrants go to China? There's one of the most successful economies growing around, aging society. You know, uh, look at Japan. Um, uh, you know, so uh, we have to, we, it's really, I'm talking to myself here and I'm talking to the European, uh, other Europeans on this call. Um, if we're not gonna be more welcoming to, to immigration, then we've got to provide more opportunities for people not to leave their countries. There's only that's the only two ways around it. Um, and I think you're more likely to be able to work this regionally than multilaterally. So I keep going back to it. Europe has a need for Africa. Africa has a need for Europe. People is as much part of the mix as goods and energy. It's people, it's uh, minerals, it is services and products. We need each other. So we just got to find mechanisms, uh, write, write up your best ideas, but think about them not at a multilateral level. Think about them as a, as a Europe, Africa axis, and then think, you know, come up with some really good ideas. And I'm sure my colleagues at Chatham House will, will help you do it. I'm conscious that it's becoming a very warm summer's evening in London, at least. Yeah. I don't want to keep anyone here for too much longer. Do two but more questions. Find two questions, Katie. Two and more I'll take questions. Them. I think we can manage that. I'll be very quick. Um, and let I, me see. Can you send me recent. the questions later on? Because they, they look so good. I have some, I try to read them, but Absolutely. everyone's got two questions. I can't. So I want to really read them later Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a question. I apologize if I can't see the name of it right now. Um, asking about Latin America's role in the increasingly tense scramble for allies between the US and mm. China. Um, China taking huge steps to consolidate its presence while the yeah. US has allowed it to occur in its own quote unquote Absolutely. backyard. Absolutely. Um, and your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's the problem. You know, just because the North is wealthy doesn't mean that the global North knows what the hell it's doing. Um, and America spent all this time worrying about China when it should have been looking a lot more sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, sorry, at uh, Latin America. Sorry, Europe spent all this time worrying about Russia when we should be thinking more about uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So we're all waking up to our South you know, and to our interdependency. Um, at the moment, I'm afraid it's the same problem that we have in Europe. Because we equate uh, the South with migration, it then gets caught up in toxic domestic politics. And rather than being forward thinking and, and creative, we start to become very uh, defensive. So um, what I'd say is the, you could say the good thing for Latin America is that because China's become so involved, the Americans are now worried about Latin America because China's there, you know? So the geopolitics becomes a reason why Europe is now starting to look more at Sub-Saharan Africa and North America is starting to look more at Latin America. But I must say, if you have a Donald Trump coming into power, it's all about how high can you build a wall. Um, and uh, I'm afraid that the Democrats, you know, one of the things that Biden is going to be very vulnerable on in the next election is the fact that immigration has risen very heavily uh, during his presidency. Now, some of that was to do with COVID. It's not, you could say it's not his fault, but he's going to get hammered with it. And it's going to be very difficult for him to be able to do anything constructively in terms of migration. What you could see him do is starting to pivot. Uh, this is where this global partnership on infrastructure investment could become important. 
um, and uh, countries like Brazil uh, can play America off against China and say, well, look, your choice, you know, if you don't come in here, we're going to take the money from China. So I think you need to play, you know, those countries in the South need to play both sides off each other. I can't say anything more constructive. I think your question was more interesting than my answer, to be frank. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe we need to just call it a uh, go there. Um, how? Let me just look at this. Maku Muzenda. How do you respond to the argument that some from the global south are positive that a Chinese or Russian world order would not be as destructive as American European? You know, what I'd say is, I'd say the following, because I think it's the pivotal question. You know, just because America and Europe were crap 100 years ago doesn't mean that we'll be crap today. You know, let's just be frank. Um, you know, humans learn and Europe has learned and Europe is doing its best. OK, uh, I haven't seen, you know, a policy on decolonization in Russia or in China. You know, democracies throw out their governments when they are bad. We get rid of them. Russia is still ruled by Putin 23 years later. Chinese might find they're still ruled by Xi Jinping 20 years later. Um, at least we get rid of our leaders. We go back over our history. We, we criticize ourselves, okay? And that's what we've been doing. So to your question, would a Russian world order, a Chinese world order be better than an American or European one? What I'd say to you is, American Europe has the power that democracy has of being able to criticize its own leaders and throw them out. And it's an incredible power. It's an incredible power to have. And I would never want to live in any society where I couldn't tell my prime minister to piss off, you know, which I think I may have done with Boris Johnson once, or at least in a book I'm told, apparently I did say that. Um, and that that gives power to civil society, gives power to positive change. So Africa and Russia, sorry, China and Russia might tell you they're on their side, but the system that they will help create in your countries is one where you know, the government is in charge and you'll never be able to say a word to them, however corrupt or bad they are. And that's the world they believe in because that's the world they live. And Chinese, you know, the Communist Party of China is a paranoid party that had to survive through paranoid means. And they will bring that paranoia in the end into the governments in China, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And Russia is even more paranoid. So if you want to be ruled by paranoid leaders in the 21st century, a world of technology and all of that stuff, good luck is what I'd say, you know, because I think, yeah, we're guilty of huge things in the past. So hold us to account, challenge us, make us do better this time. Because I think the governments in Europe and America are willing to listen. The people certainly are. People like us at Chatham House certainly are. So hold us to account, challenge us. You know, I think that's a more constructive way forward. And challenge us to work with China. Don't ask us to work with Russia, okay? Just don't ask us to work with Russia. Because under Vladimir Putin, Russians, I'm not talking about Russians, but the government of Vladimir Putin is too brutal. He has no one's interest in his heart. But challenge us to work with China, I have no problem with that. I'll stop there. That's my meta comment. I think that's a really interesting point to leave on, that kind of challenge to collaboration as opposed to competition when we can find it and in the right conditions. Exactly. Um, thank you so much for such a comprehensive whirlwind tour of multilateralism, the challenges, the potential, the opportunity. I think the number of comments that we've had come in and the questions um, really shows how much our members have valued your contributions. Um, I'll just give a little detail about the next step in the challenge. Um, so the things that you're posting in the chat are exactly what we wanna see on the platform. So if you copy and paste them over into the brainstorm, that would be really valuable. We wanna hear your thoughts um, and what you see as the big challenges for multilateralism and the international system right now. Um, our next webinar, we'll be looking at inclusive governance um, and we'll be sure to get the link to you when we have it ready for you to register. Um, I've just put in the chat um, some upcoming events that are relevant to the issue. So we've got tomorrow an event at Chatham House on China's modernization and its relationship with the West. And then coming up um, on the 29th of June, we've got the London Conference, which is on the topic of multilateralism. Um, so you'll be able to join all day here from the sessions um, it's sure to be a really interesting event. And I hope that this 
has given you a really great primer into what you'll be able to hear. So I think, yeah. Thank you very much, Robin, again. And I hope- no, I want to, I want to see the results. Time. I'm excited. I can't wait to see you, what you do with this year. I mean, honestly, Absolutely. what you're doing is the most important thing. So I'm going to have a read. Um, if you can share with me, Kato, later on the, the chat line as well. I'd love to read all the stuff I wasn't able to read. Um, so thanks very much indeed. And and good luck. Do it because it's, it's, your, it's your futures, folks.